A few years ago, back in 2013, some random person on Steam was telling me about this new game he sold called Undertale. Initially, I didn't give much thought to it because to me it looked like just about any other indie game that ever existed. However, after bypassing its Kickstarter goal of $5,000 to reach $50,000, it ended up being hyped around various corners of the internet. I'm saying that because when I was doing research for this review, I typed the game in on a search engine and saw a TV Tropes page, a Know Your Meme page, a official Tumblr page, and a Wikipedia page for the WWE wrestler The Undertaker. Wikipedia doesn't even have an article on it, but TV Tropes does. I don't know about you, but that's a major red flag for me at least considering the reputations of those websites. So anyways, I forgot about this game because it spent a lot more time than an 8-bit pixel game should have been in development. I mean, heck, if a AAA game publisher can put out a game in two years, then why should it take so long for a retro 8-bit pixel game? So anyways, recently the game got a release date, and now it's finally out. Now, after lurking forums and seeing gamers talking about waifus and dating characters, I was realizing that that's not just a red flag, but that's a Mountain Dew Code Red level cringe alert, especially with the hip and trendy 8-bit art style this game uses. I also noticed negative reviews of this game were being hidden for some reason. Hmm, probably somebody flagging them down. And I was also seeing people talking about how deep the story was when it was coming off as edgy to me. And now I was interested in seeing just how deep the rabbit hole went. So here I am with a copy of this game and now I'm ready to review it. Now first, let's talk about the technical aspects of the game. Now if you're one of those people who obsesses over 8-bit graphics and believes that graphics don't matter whatsoever, then don't worry, I'll talk about the gameplay itself in the video too. But first, let's get to the technical aspects of the game and get them out of the way, since it's a giant elephant in the room right now. First, let's take a look at the system requirements. The operating system and hard disk requirements are about what you'd expect for a PC game with these graphics and that. However, the memory and graphics memory required are absolutely insane for an 8-bit retro game. 2 gigs of RAM and 120 megabytes of video RAM for what should simply be an 8-bit game? That's more excessive than even Crisis, a game known in 2007 for not only having insane graphics, but also making everyone's expensive PCs crawl to a halt, and also causing the next version of CryEngine to be optimized for consoles in an attempt to both boost sales and have third parties license the engine, unlike what happened with the CryEngine 2. Now just think about that for a second. See what's wrong with an 8-bit indie game requiring specs similar to Crisis to run? I mean, it's like if you needed an R9 380 or 390 to run a game with graphics on the level of a PS2 or early PS3 or 360 game. It also lacks a GNU slash Linux, mobile, or console version, despite the fact that the tool he used actually supports exporting games to Linux and cell phones and mobile devices. And I'll get to that in a second once I show you how the game runs on real world hardware. So now it's time to do a real world test of this game on real world hardware. Let's test it on a few trashy computers, a cheap $99 WinBook tablet, an Acer netbook from 2009 or 10 which had Windows XP on it, and an IBM SurePost cash register. You know, the stuff you'll see at a fast food place that they'll put the orders in before they give you your burger and fries. Let's start with the WinBook tablet. The specs of this are basic with only 32 gigs of storage which is destroyed by Windows, 2 gigs of RAM and a quad-core Atom Z3735. It struggled to run the game as I found out the DRM free version at least extracts the game itself to your hard disk which is tiny on this tablet. I found out using 7-zip I could extract the container file though and get the game files themselves. After struggling with bizarre error messages the game loaded and eventually ran just fine. On another PC, I did some research and I found out that the game actually extracts itself and deletes itself afterwards, which is a terrible way of executing a game. It's literally on the level of Respawl's 50 gig Titanfall audio files. The Acer netbook is basically this average trashy computer someone has lying around and probably uses to browse Facebook and maybe play a few older 8-bit pixel indie games. It has an Intel Atom N270, 2 gigs of RAM, and Windows 10. Can it run Undertale? It can, but at a slowish frame rate. It does in fact work on the netbook, however, and many people still use trashy computers on this level. So now for the final test. 
a test with 2004-2005 hardware, an IBM cache register. Now this IBM cache register has a netburst based Celeron 512 megs of RAM and INTEL EXTREME GRAPHICS! In other words, it's like a PC from 2004 or 5. Now can it run Undertale? Well first, just to see how well it could handle retro indie games, I tried running Cave Story, the original retro indie game on it, and it ran fine at a playable frame rate. After all, Cave Story was the game that every 8-bit retro game was influenced by, so why was I playing it on there? Well, I was just getting a feel for how retro indie games should run on this computer, and instead I got glitched out garbage from the last game I played on the screen, and while rebooting cleared it, I was still unable to play the game as it was slamming the CPU hard. In other words, nope, it can't run Undertale, a retro 8-bit game. Despite being able to run 3D games based on the Gold Source or original Unreal Engine. And why did I play this game on PCs this old? Well, I know that there are people who, for a fact, were running Minecraft on an e-machines which had a GeForce 4 plugged into it very recently. And yes, that's right, a GeForce 4 MX, not a GeForce 400 series. And I'm not making this up either. And I'm not even getting into people probably running Minecraft on stuff such as those cheap low-end Winbook tablets. So I decided to run this game on hardware you'd find in the real world. And why was it that badly optimized? Well, let me explain it in two words. Game Maker. Yup, that's right. The number one tool of choice for game making among kids and kids at computer camps was used to make this game. After all, when I think of Game Maker, I think of that computer camp I went to several years ago where kids were making very basic platform games using Pokemon midis from VG Music. But now it's time to talk about the game itself on a higher power PC with a second generation i5, 8 gigs of RAM, and an R9 380. It can run Battlefield 4, Call of Duty Advanced Warfare, and other games on high settings, so it should run this game well. I mean, it can even run freaking Call of Duty Ghosts of all things at playable settings, and we all know how that game was unoptimized, so let's see how this game runs and how the game itself plays. So I loaded up the game and it, well, it ran about as well as you'd expect for an 8-bit indie game on modern hardware. Thanks to the fact that the developer used Game Maker instead of buying a copy of the C++ programming language on Amazon and learning it, or just using one of the millions of YouTube tutorials on it, the game runs in an unresizable border that takes up a tiny corner of your monitor if you have a monitor monitor, or full screen in whatever your current resolution is by pressing the F4 key. The game does, however, know its target audience very well, as it uses the emulator control scheme, as in arrow keys and ZXC. WASD doesn't do whatsoever anything, and I couldn't find any way to remap the controls either. However, my senses were under various forms of assault. My ears were under assault from the dull, generic role-playing game music that feels half 8-bit and half generic MIDI straight out of Windows Media Player. Thankfully, I was able to unplug my headset and plug in my iPod, and I ended up loading my favorite album for cringing at things in flak format, Station to Station by David Bowie, featuring drugs. The graphics were bleh. Imagine that generic Tumblr tryhard artsy hipster style you've seen about a million times on art sites mixed with 8-bit sprites. There's something extremely dull about it, and this art style especially doesn't go well with the edginess found later on in the game in differing parts from what I could tell. The battle graphics are especially terrible, and it's like early 80s home computer graphics mixed with the art direction of a mediocre deviant artist with a tablet. I mean, it's like when a cutesy deviant art fan artist decides to try drawing porn or very mature subject matter art in the same exact style. It's just out of place, and yes, I have seen this all the time on various art sites. Similar to other trashy role-playing games, this game is loaded with unfunny fourth wall humor. You know, the same style of humor you'll find in a cut-rate YouTube series made by a bunch of kids. And it tries to really force its point across, along with the wow guys, this is an amazing epic deconstruction of RPGs part, depending on how you play the game. The game is also extremely dull, as after all, when you're making a game, rule 1 should be hook the player. 
Nothing causes gamers to abandon a game faster than it being extremely dull. Because that's the thing with games, especially of this length. You have to hook the gamer, or they won't keep playing it. And did I mention the battle system's dull? It consists of yourself trying to avoid the white stuff not to take damage instead of a traditional system in an attempt to be try-hard artsy. The game also tries really hard to encourage you to play as a pacifist, and even gives you a talk option copied straight from Shin Megami Tensei, which in my opinion did it much better. Then again, Mega Ten looks like it has effort put into it, and doesn't look like it was fueled by Tumblr. In other words, this game is complete and utter cringe. Play this game if you want to cringe until you wonder why you're lurking on the dark corners of the internet again and need eye and ear bleach afterwards. Otherwise, skip this game. There are much better games available for $10, and much better role-playing games on Steam for that matter, that don't try to cater to the retro 8-bit indie crowd, who think that adding bits and pieces of stuff makes a game deep and mature and MUFFEELS! Thanks for watching and subscribe for more.